everybody, Joanna here. Today I'm going to be talking about the Age of Madness trilogy by Joe Abercrombie. And I'm also going to be doing so by comparing it in part to the original trilogy in the first Saw world. And to make this comprehensive, I'll briefly touch upon the three standalones as well. But this will be a totally spoiler free video, even if you've never picked up a single first Saw book before. I'm hoping this will be helpful to decide if this is the series for you or not. Or even if you've finished the first trilogy and you're curious about what's ahead. I hope this will be helpful. So first and foremost, when you hear about the first law, I think you'll often hear about the characters, about how amazing the character work is. And yes, these characters come off the page. They are distinct. They are fascinating. They are flawed. And at the same time, I think that it's important and worth noting that this is not the series that you want to pick up if you want characters to have this amazing heroic fantasy arc, if you want to see them grow and change into something amazing by the end of a series or story, then this might not be the series for you. Characters do change in the series, but not in the way that you might want them to and not in the most idealistic way. And I think that we do take a critical view on human agency and human psychology. And I think that's portrayed very well through these characters. And the other thing you'll probably hear about when you hear about Abercrombie or First Law is how funny these books are because they are. They're hilarious. And I think the humor here does have some gallows humor, but there's also some satirical humor and also some absurdity as well, not just through the characters themselves, but also through some of the societal themes, I would say in Age of Madness specifically. So I'll be getting into that a little bit later. The other thing to keep in mind when it comes to reading a First Law World book is the world building. You're not going to get heavy descriptive world building or settings like you would in A Song of Ice and Fire or Malaz and Book of the Fallen or Lord of the Rings. I would say there is, you know, there obviously are territories and cultures, but it's on a much more minimal level. And you do see how those things affect the characters directly, but it's really all through the character specifically as the focus. And again, through society as a focus later as you move on in the series. Um, the other thing, too, is magic. There is magic in First Law, but I don't think it's quite as prominent as some other series in fantasy. It's there. It's very subtle. It's more on the soft side. No hard rules. No big explanations there. So uh, just things to keep in mind. But overall, this series is so entertaining, so delightful, at least if you can get behind those things that I mentioned. And from here, I'm going to go ahead and talk about the differences between Age of Madness and the original trilogy, at least my experience, and how I think that these two compare to one another. So I would say with the original trilogy, I struggled with the first book, The Blade itself. I remember immediately enjoying Abercrombie's prose. I felt like there was such a flow to the way that he would write his sentences, there was a certain rhythm to it, and I enjoyed his humor and his character work. But I found at a certain point I was really struggling to figure out the focus in the story. And then when I read the second book, Before They Are Hanged, I always say that book changed me as a reader because I realized in that book that I didn't even care about where the story was going, what the goal was, what the characters were after. I just lived for the characters on the page, the combinations of characters, the banter, the dialogue, and yes, Abercrombie has a way with dialogue. Every character, like I said, is very distinct and well-realized, but the dialogue is very witty. And there's wonderful banter, wonderful internal dialogue, which usually contrasts the external dialogue. So it's just a lot of fun from that perspective. So I was having a great time. And then I read the third book, Last Argument of Kings, and I realized, oh, wow, there's been a plot all along, and I just didn't see it. And then once I finished and saw it, it made me appreciate the first book even more, so much so that I think rereading that book would be a joy. But on to how that compares to Age of Madness, not knowing what the focus of the story was in the first Law trilogy, I never felt like that was an issue in Age of Madness. I felt like it was almost the opposite. The chapters are very short, and so I felt like it was more a matter of me trying to keep up with what the characters were scheming towards, because they are constantly scheming, and I don't feel like there's any question about what most of them are after. And so it was, again, a matter of keeping up. Uh, so I feel like it was kind of fast moving as far as the turn of events and the ways that they would respond to those turns of events. And then the other thing I would say that is very different in the Age of Madness has to do with characters again, and that's the female character representation. I've heard from a few people who've started the First Law trilogy 
that they weren't really crazy about the lack of female characters or the female characters we did get in the original trilogy. And I understand that criticism, but I will say that even with the standalones, we do get some great female representation. So for example, with Best Serve Cold, we get Monza Mercado, and this is very much a vengeance quest from her perspective, mostly. It is multi-POV, but mostly from her perspective. And then we get some female characters in the heroes, including Finry, which I really enjoyed. And this is a three-day battle with no heroes. <laughs> and then we also get Red Country. And Red Country is the Western version of Abercrombie. This had Chai South, another fantastic female character. But all that said, the Age of Madness trilogy is where the female character work shines. There are several amazing female characters in the Age of Madness trilogy. I think that the female characters possibly outshined the male characters in this particular trilogy. So we have Savine, who is my favorite. I love Savine. Savine is now possibly my favorite female character in all of fantasy. She's very ambitious and cunning and brilliant. And then we have a character named Vic, who is trying to remain very hardened to the world and not be very connected to others and just do her job. And then we have a character named Rika, who really marches to the beat of her own drum. So wonderful female primary characters, but also a bunch of wonderful other female characters in the story. And I think if your only complaint about the original trilogy has to do with the female characterization, you're in for a treat if you read on, especially in Age of Madness. Definitely my favorite. And the next has to do with themes. Now, when it came to reading the First Law trilogy, I felt like that particular trilogy got my mind working thinking about psychology, specifically attribution theory, and whether characters attribute their success to luck, effort, ability, or task difficulty. And so I thought it was so much fun to explore that with those characters and see how they perceive their own locus of control. But we also get a lot of subverted tropes in fantasy in the First Law world in general. So in the first trilogy, I think we get some I can't really give it away because of spoilers, but we do get some subversions of like the quest journey, for example. And I think like the heroes, for example, that standalone really takes a critical view on heroism in fantasy. But what I appreciated in the Age of Madness were the societal themes. So we get micro views of themes from the character perspective, such as hypocrisy, betrayal, treason, conspiracy. But then we get these macro societal views of war, revolution, rebellion, industry, progress, efficiency, and I just really enjoyed the exploration of those themes, again, through the micro perspective of characters, but even society as a whole being a character in and of itself. I thought it was so well handled and even had some great absurdity in there and it was just a joy to read about. So funny, definitely taking a critical view, not just of fantasy in the trilogy, but of society at large of the Industrial Revolution and things beyond that. So I really enjoyed that. But the other thing too that I loved more about the Age of Madness trilogy was the end. I thought that the ending for me of this trilogy, this might vary across readers, I'm not sure yet, but I thought it was so satisfying personally. And I actually personally loved the end of the original trilogy, but that's a very divisive ending. Some people really don't like the ending of the First Law trilogy. I personally loved it, but it will be hit or miss. But I guess one of the reasons I think Age of Madness really landed for me personally was it actually was very touching at times. <laughs> and I don't know if that's just me having a very weird, dark perspective of what's touching. I don't know. There is a 30-year gap between the original trilogy and the second trilogy, The Age of Madness. And as far as the standalones, I do think that you should read this series in publication order, meaning read the original trilogy Read the three standalones, the order again being Best Serve Cold, which is a vengeance tale, The Heroes, which is three men, one battle, no heroes, and then Red Country, which is a Western version of the first law and has kind of a Bonnie and Clyde thing, which I loved. I loved this particular book. This was my favorite of the standalones. And while each of these books are standalones because they have separate story arcs, but at the same time, they tie in things that happened from the original trilogy and they lead to things that happen in the Age of Madness. So for that reason, I really think it's the best idea to read these in order. Now to talk about specific highlights for Age of Madness, as I mentioned, this is the dawning of the Industrial Revolution, and so we do get industry and progress, and this is juxtaposed with 
revolution, rebellion, conspiracy, betrayal, all types of different things happening on a societal level and with the characters. And the characters were such a joy in this particular trilogy. I already talked about the female characters, but we have so many interesting characters that we follow who are all operating on their own misbeliefs about themselves and the world. So we have a character who wants to be king, but a lazy king and not do much. We have a character who wants to be queen or just rise to the top. We have a character who wants to be a hero and a character who just wants to stay out of trouble. We have a character who wants to be an inconspicuous spy and remain hardened to the world. And then we have a character who just wants to be herself and nobody's fool. And we see how well they succeed at their tasks. But what I really loved about these characters were the ways that they contrasted one another. So this was something that I greatly appreciated specifically in Age of Madness was anytime I would just look at a page, I would notice how there'd be a character expressing one emotion or mannerism, and this would be contrasted by another character expressing a different mannerism or different expression. And it was so effortlessly handled. I felt like he was able to write in such a way that there was a flow to it. And it was so entertaining and fascinating to read about. It was part of the humor, I would say, too. So what came to my mind when I was reading those sections was one of my favorite pieces of music, which is the quartet in Verdi's Rigoletto. You probably know the opera by the famous tune. La donna è mobile, qual fiume al vento. But there is a particular quartet in that opera where there are four characters on stage expressing four emotions at the same time, and Verdi's music perfectly supports this happening. So we have a duke who's a womanizer, and he's seducing this burglar woman who's been around the block. So she's not being a fool. She knows he's a player, and she's laughing at him. So he's seducing her with this beautiful love song, and she's laughing at him. And then outside, looking in on them, spying on them, this young ingenue, this young innocent girl who was seduced by the Duke earlier in the opera, she did fall for his love song. And so she's heartbroken seeing that he's using those these words on the burglar woman because she fell for it. <laughs> And then her father, Rigoletto, the hunchback, who's angry because he's seen the Duke do this. He's angry that his daughter is heartbroken and he's wanting to comfort his daughter at the same time. <laughs> While, of course, in books, you can't really have things happening exactly at the same time the way you can in music, I still feel like Abercrombie achieved a similar effect while well, perhaps more darkly humorous than Rigoletto, but it came to mind because I just thought it was genius the way he did it. The other thing I want to mention about the primary characters is how they would commit to some deplorable acts. These were not necessarily good people, and yet they were so much fun to follow. They were so interesting, and they were endearing at times. Okay, maybe not all of them. There were two I wanted to punch in the face for sure, but some of them were very endearing, and I think that the way Abercrombie achieved this effect was through parental influence. So there were scenes where we have characters interacting with their parents. And I love those scenes. And they were funny too at times, but I also found them very sweet because we saw the innocence in these characters who committed, you know, horrible acts. And so I thought it was so endearing. And sometimes it wasn't even just directly on the page with characters interacting with their parents. Sometimes characters would just remember things that their father would say or their mother would say. And I know we see a little bit of that in the original trilogy with a certain character, but I just love that. The other way that I felt like the characters were very endearing at times was the way that they interacted with some of the secondary characters. There are wonderful secondary characters in this trilogy. So a few that come to mind, Zuri and Talo and Hildi and Isern. So the way that these primary characters interacted with these secondary characters, I thought maybe showed a softer side. While at the same time, like I said, they do some pretty horrible things. And the other thing to say about the secondary characters is that they really do add a lot to the story. And the other thing to say about side characters too is that there are these chapters in the books called The Little People. There are a few different chapters by that title. And in these chapters, we get these little vignettes 
from characters in society that are giving you a deeper insight into the world and into society and what's happening. And I really enjoyed that. I thought it added so much dimension to what was happening. So I thought that was such a delight. I've heard various reactions to the short story collection, Sharp Ends. That is the one for Slaw book I have not yet read. I've heard his short story format is maybe not as strong as it is for novels, but I did question that because I thought those little people chapters were so good. Um, anyhow, I thought that this was just a delight to read. So entertaining, so funny, so compelling, and oddly heartwarming at times. Like I said, I was surprised about that. Uh, tell me if you feel the same way. But in any case, I would love to hear from you. Please let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. And thank you so much for watching. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.